Hey everybody, real pleasure to be here. My name is Vivek. Uh, I'm, I'm a comedian, that's my job. And I must say though, as a comedian, immediately expectations begin, right? First thing, oh yeah, tell me a joke, right? Are you funny? I can tell people jokes, are you funny, right? But I must say one thing, a lot of misunderstandings happen. As a comedian, people expect certain things like, you know, you must be happy all day, you know? Do you make yourself laugh? Can you imagine if I made myself laugh writing a joke? <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> That's weird, right? But I must say, as a comedian, what I do is not to be a funnier person than you, not to live a funnier life than you. I simply try to understand or explain the world in a way that is funny. So I'm not trying to tell you funny things. I'm trying to see the world, the normal things we do, and try to explain it to you in a way that is humorous and will make you laugh. For example, I grew up here in Hong Kong, right? And uh, I went to a local Chinese school. The reason is, my family, my parents don't speak Cantonese. And they realize the limitations in Hong Kong if you cannot speak Cantonese, right? So they decided instead of them suffering and learning Cantonese, let's make our son do the hard work, right? We get free translation service, why not, okay? But the good thing is that now I speak fluent Cantonese and it's very beneficial. Of course, my face not being Chinese, it's a lot of fun. However, I always tell people, you have to be careful though. The more Chinese you learn or the more Chinese you speak, the less English you will use without realizing it. For example, I no longer do I say things such as, excuse me, I'm sorry, so that I don't say that anymore. Like for example, if I'm on the street, right, and some guy bumps into me, and I want to say, oh, I'm so sorry for bumping into you. My apologies, please have a lovely day. My brain is thinking that, but my mouth will automatically translate that to Cantonese. Yeah, right? My, my brain, brain is thinking, thinking I'm sorry for bumping into you, please have a lovely day. But my mouth in Cantonese will just say, <laughs> right? Because it's so efficient, right? Here in Hong Kong, we don't have time for politeness and all that. We're busy, we gotta go. Which is why what I do is to trick my friends when they come to Hong Kong. I tell them, oh, in Cantonese, means thank you. <laughs> wow, Hong Kong people are so nice. I'm like, yeah, man. They're like, they let me all day. I'm like, yeah, that's what we do. We love you over here, right? But what did I just do just now? I simply took something we all do and reframed it changed the angle and made a joke out of it. Did I just tell you a funny thing? No, I just simply reframed the idea of using in our daily life, right? It's a weird concept, because here in Hong Kong, I noticed that people will anything, you know? You miss a bus, you're like Like, the bus doesn't care, it's gone, right? Anything happens, they'll look at it like that kind of thing. And this is a very, very powerful sound that you just know the feeling behind it, the emotion behind it. Why are you laughing so much? Because you're like, I know the feeling. I know what it takes to make me go, right? I know it's anything. You have to be a certain level, you know? If, for example, uh, you line up next to me and you're talking very loud on your phone, you might know them. You won't do that because that's no big deal. Noise is big, it's very normal here in Hong Kong. But let's say someone cuts you in line, or you know, they bump into you, or you know, they say something about you and you go, ah, these people, you know? There's a certain reason you will somebody, right? But you think about it. As a comedian, all I did was sit back, watch on the side, and try to observe what are people doing. And not just watch, but also try to understand why are they doing that? Why do we do this? In Hong Kong, why do we have this habit that we stand on the right side of the escalator, but not on the left? There's no law, but we just know you stand on the right, you walk on the left, right? And should for some reason, you're walking up the escalator and see somebody for some odd reason decides today they will stand on the left side. We don't say, excuse me, we don't even go, you know what we do? We just look at them, just staring at their heads like, <laughs> right? And they should feel a set of eyes like, oh, I feel something, I better move, I better move, right? So that's what I mean. As a comedian, I'm not trying to live a funnier life than you. I, just, I keep reinforcing it because a lot of times when I get interviewed, it's like, oh, babe, you know, how come you're so positive? Why are you so funny? I'm like, it's not about that. It's simply the curiosity to understand the world, but not accepting the face value of that's how it is. You know, that's what it is. You know, accept it for what it is. No, I'm not willing to accept that. What happened was when I was growing up, I could never fit in. I was always a non-Chinese kid in my group. I went to a Chinese school, maybe there were like three non-Chinese kids in my whole school, right? Which meant I could not just follow. I could not just say, what do you do? Let me do that as well. I could not do that. I had to figure out my own way. And in many ways, it's because of that, it became a normal thing for me to be the odd one out. So as a comedian, what I'm doing is I'm looking at life the same we all have, but trying to find that angle that we did not notice, the angle that we did not realize, hey, wait a second, he's right, that's a good point, right? So a lot of these things, for example, 
people used to not, I, I've been, you know, racial discrimination is the hot topic that people ask me all the time. Oh, Viv, are you discriminated? Do you feel discrimination? Now, it's all about how you perceive it, you know? Like, for example, I'll give you a classic example. So one day I'm walking on the street, right? And this guy bumps into me. He's like, hey, you see, quite a little <laughs> Discrimination, right? But I did not get upset for that. I was angry. I was like, Abba! Oh, my vital leg, my tire. Right? Because I always say, you want to discriminate? I don't mind that, but do it correctly, you know? You don't even know the right term. How can I feel hurt correctly? This is weird. I don't know what to feel. Do you think I'm too white? No, I'm, I'm Indian. I'm proud to be Indian, you know? So what did I do there? I did not just say, oh, discrimination, that's wrong or right. I did not judge the situation. I tried to understand it. Why did this man even do this? Why did he have this need to say this? Like, it's not like it's going to change the situation. He could have just said, and that's it, right? But no, he did not decide to do that. He went the other route. Now, again, it's these situations that allow me to find a funny story out of it and tell you these situations. You might not have been in it, you might not have experienced it, but hopefully the way I tell you, you can not just know it, but feel it. So at the end of the day, as a comedian, what I'm really doing is, I'm not trying to tell you information. I'm not just trying to tell you a funny story. I'm trying to make you feel it in a certain way that I felt as well. I'm trying to understand the world and try to be like, why is this happening? And how can I tell somebody the way I see it? So this is a recurring factor for me that I find when I was growing up, I could never just say, oh, is this what you do? Fine, whatever, no questions asked, just follow the herd. No, I could not do that. My friends would wear a certain shirt, I'd wear it, it would look weird on me, you know. My friends would have a certain habit, I would try to do it, it would not work for me. A lot of things I would start to realize, I like the idea of never fitting in. I like the idea of how I'm finding my own way without even trying to ask, what do you do as reference? I'm just gonna figure it out as I go. When I was growing up, I loved, I loved listening to music, but the type of music I listen to is heavy metal music, which is really bizarre, because a lot of times, before I go for, let's say, a comedy show, or let's say a school has invited me to give a speech, you know, morning assembly, comedy, whatever, I'm listening to heavy metal music before the whole event. The music is going, oh, blah, 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 blah. like the louder, the angrier, the better. I love that music. The moment I take it off, hey guys, it's a comedy time. You know, it's a weird contrast. Now, I have been told by some group this doesn't make sense. You know, you listen to this crazy, angry, violent music, but you're trying to make people laugh. Are you, what's weird? What's wrong with you? Hey, there's nothing wrong. I can enjoy the music and switch at one stage and do comedy. There's nothing wrong about it, which is why I keep finding I like the idea that what I do has maybe been unheard of, is not common, or it's just hard to accept. So when I tell people I'm a comedian, that's my job, that's how I make a living, automatically parents are mind blown. They're like, huh? You're telling me I can buy a flat with comedy? No, this doesn't make sense, right? But what I always say is that what a lot of people see is a face value. When you see a comedian, you think of certain things. You think, okay, this guy, he tells jokes, people laugh, they pay for a ticket, they go home. What you don't realize is that behind the scenes, there's a lot more that can be done. People might contact me for different events. Like, I've been in invited for, to be MCs for events, right? A lot of things that might have been useless, you have to find the potential behind it, which is what, as a comedian, I'm trying to do. I'm trying to look at the most boring parts of life and somehow find the funny potential behind it. I can give you so many examples of this where like, um, things you might have thought, or I might have thought was rubbish, actually is very valuable. So as a kid, I love playing computer games, and I still do. And one of my favorite games is Street Fighter, right? I'm sure some of you have played it and everything. Street Fighter, very simple game, you know, like Mortal Kombat. Two people just fight, you know? You, you pick a, the Brazilian guy versus the Japanese guy, you know, Hadouken, this, whatever, okay? They fight. Now, of course, I'm Indian. If I play the game and I don't pick the Indian guy, my friends tell me, oh, you don't love your country? What's wrong with you? <laughs> and I don't like it, but I must say, though, the fun part is that with that game, it wasn't even the fighting part that I liked. I liked the, the voiceover guy. I liked the sound that they go before the fight begins when they say, round one, fight. I love that voice. You win, perfect. You know, I love that. I loved it so much when I was in primary school, I would imitate the voice all the time, you know? I'd be in class, you know, mathematics class. The teacher's like, okay, math multiplication, um, six times six, um, Vivek, what is six times six? And I'll stand up and say, 36, <laughs> right? The teacher cannot punish me because the answer was correct, right? Six times six is 36, I'm not wrong, you know? I mean, the teacher can say, well, what's wrong with your voice? Puberty, whatever, you know? <laughs> I can say what I like, you don't know. But my point is this, at that moment, this was a silly voice, you know, this is just a hobby, just a silly thing that I like to do on the side. But in 2011, there was an organization, a mixed martial arts organization, that was looking for a, for a ring announcer, you know, a bilingual ring announcer, or like a, a representing Asian, you know, culture. So they were contacting different people, and I was one of the people they contacted, or they found out, and they're like, hey, you want to try this out? 
I've never had any training. I'm a comedian. Like, well, this doesn't make sense. You know, I just hold a mic and tell jokes. I'm not going to talk about fights and everything. But I figured, hey, you know what? Round one, fight. Let's do this, you know? So I did that. And all of a sudden, that silly voice that no one, even including myself, would have thought had any value or potential behind it, now has something I could use. And what's happened is, over the years, over the last, what, six, seven years, a lot of mixed martial arts events have invited me, the comedian, to go on stage, wear a suit, and get angry. Ladies and gentlemen, our fighter number one, you know? And I'm doing that. All of a sudden, I could be doing comedy the night before, making people laugh, and the next night, I'm introducing guys in their underwear. This is insane, right? This doesn't make sense. But I must say, this is what I love about it, that there's potential in everything. And that's what my mind is trying to do. I have a firm belief that everywhere you look, there is some potential, and including not just the world around you, but yourself. It's about interview. Now, I want, I want to say one thing, though. Most comedians are quite quiet. Not because we're not talkative or anything, because a lot of times we like to think. We're just trying to analyze the situation. Rather than just say what we think, tweet what we think, immediately post what we think, we're like, hmm, interesting. Let me have a little, little Little, uh, think about this, you know, let me see what I can see. Let me twist the angle, let's move it around and play with it, you know. So what I always say is that I have to spend a lot of time kind of going inside and knowing what I'm thinking or who I am or what I like more than trying to live a life that's, you know, exciting, I'm bungee jumping today, I'm over here today. So what I actually do is I write a journal every day. And I don't just write a journal, you know, write a journal of your diary, I love my life, I love all that stuff, no. I actually use an online service that will send me an email every day and say, how was your day? Reply the email. So it's in my inbox. I, have a, I, I need to reply the email, right? But the trick is not just that. What it does is it will send me an email that I wrote, my journal entry from one year ago, and will say, this time last year, you said this. So suddenly, now I'm given this whole year's period to not look back what happened to me one year ago. Because Carol Burnett, a very famous comedian, once said, comedy is equal to tragedy plus time. So what would be tragic maybe one year ago, after a while, might become comedy when you think about it. Like, for example, if you have a reunion with your classmates, you know, you might not be coming back here, sit, let's sit all together and talk about how we all got straight A's, you know. Let's talk about the successful time we won the competition. No, we want to talk about the time when you were late for school, or you got punished, or you lost your homework, or whatever happened, right? That's fun to discuss. No one wants to talk about how you won the Mark 6, no one cares about that. We want to hear about how you lost your wallet and what did you do to pay for the bill, you know, that kind of stuff. So what I find is that that, that little twist of not just writing a journal, but rereading what I wrote one year ago is one of my biggest inspirations for comedy. Because what might have happened, like today I just say, oh, I went to over here, I gave a talk, at the little at home, no, whatever, no big deal. But what will happen is one year from now, I might have a lot of things happen to me. And suddenly, when I look back at this situation right here, I might say, ooh, it's pretty cool, you know, I came to this area, it's very nice, the stage, you have the for boards and everything, and big letters and everything to make sure we can all read what the branding is, you know. I might think like that. So what will happen is that I'm spending a lot more time trying to go in, trying to talk to myself, rather than just say, okay, you know, what's funny in the room? Let me make a joke about the chairs. Okay, red chairs. I'm not doing that. I'm just sitting there like, okay, let everything happen. Let me process everything. Let me digest it and find the angle. So what I want to really say is that it's not that, you know, I'm a comedian and everything, but we're all potential comedians. We all have that funny story. But have you spent the time to kind of digest it and try to know yourself and what do you think of the story? So when I get on stage, right, a lot of times it depends on the audience, what I have to say to them and everything, but what will happen is that I'm not just conveying information, I'm conveying an experience. So when I talk about the whole like, thing, I'm not just saying, hey, you know what, the other day I went up to somebody, he bumped into me and he said, right? It's so common, right? When I say that, it's just information. It's very flat. You don't feel anything about it. When I try to connect with you, when I say, oh, we all do this, you know, this, this thing happened to me. Or you know what we talk about when we go, you're like, oh, I, I do that too, I can, I can relate. So all of a sudden, I've hooked you into this story. I've made you feel something that I'm feeling as well. Not to say that you've done the exact same thing, but like you can relate to it and say, like, oh, I, I see what you're feeling at. So a lot of times, my stories are not just about information, and I encourage you, when you think about yourself, don't just think about, you know, oh, you know, uh, uh, am I happy, am I sad, or anything. But try to understand, why am I happy? Why does this upset me? Why do I like heavy metal music? I'll give you a prime example. Heavy metal music, why I like it so much, is not just because it's noisy, because it's so authentic. You cannot fake heavy metal music. In other words, you can pretend to like hip-hop. You can say, I love jazz, you know. But heavy metal music is so noisy that you cannot fake it for an hour. Like, oh, you know, like, you know what, I don't like it, I don't like it, right? That's what I mean. You can't fake it with comedy. I could be world famous, but if I'm not funny, I'm not funny. I could be handsome, 
I'm not funny, I'm not funny. It's very authentic. What I find about myself is that I love things that are really authentic. I don't want sugar coating, I don't want nice politeness, I want reality. I want the guy to discriminate me in my face. You know, I want that kind of story. And I'll give you a prime example. Discrimination is one of the things that I find is just so weird for me because I speak Cantonese, which gives me a double-edged thing where I'm like, I know you're discriminating me, but I'm too polite to interrupt you, so I'll let you discriminate me first before I tell you I know what you just said. So it's happened to me so many times. Like, I'll take the MTR, I'll give you a prime example, okay? So one day, I had a big boss I had to go deliver, right? Now, I'm taking the MTR, it's 5.36 p.m., you know, rush hour, everything. I'm an admiralty going to Shimsa Chui. Big box in my hand, lining up, thousands of people waiting to get on the train. Lining up over there, the train arrives. Like a mosh pit, we're all running into the train, but oh, let's go, right? Okay. I'm almost at the train. Oh, come on, come on, let me fit, let me fit, let me fit, let me fit, right? I get to the train, I see Ooh, just enough space for me and the boss, yes! Now, I'm an admiralty going to get up at Chimsai Chili, so I decide, you know what? Long-term planning, let me go in backwards, right? So I get into the train, I'm like, ooh, look at me, you know, long-term planning, I know I can get off, we can good. So I'm standing there. Now, I'm waiting for the doors to close. Everyone on the platform does not say anything. You only see a thousand people looking at me, and suddenly you hear a thousand <laughs> right? And I'm suddenly like, oh, whatever, I can't help you, I'm sorry, right? Suddenly, this really short Chinese gentleman walks up to the front, you know, he, he, just, he just cuts the queue, he just stands up to the front, he looks at me, he's like, yeah. And I'm like, what? what's wrong with this guy? He's looking at that, he's like, yeah. He sees a little bit of space, and I'm like, no, no way, no, no, right? Does not care, and he starts, and he's like, he's like, what, what are you pumping the air out of yourself so you're thinner? I don't understand this concept. Right? So I'm pulling the ball standing over there like, oh, this guy, no way, there's no way he's gonna do this. He's like, <laughs> yeah, boom, just bangs into me. I'm like, oh, okay. He pumps into me, the whole car, you know, everyone in the car moves back, oh, okay, whatever, you are like, okay, you know what? Just close the door. I don't just, just close the door. Now, finally the train door is closed, and I'm just standing there like, okay, whatever, I can't move, he can't move, whatever, who cares? One station that's just about. Now we all know. Admiralty to Chinsachoy is at least one minute train journey, right? So we're there, no movement at all, him looking at me, I'm looking at him, it's super romantic. <laughs> right? That is when he decides, you know what, while we're here, let me insult this guy. So he starts to whip out the Cantonese and starts to yell at me and everything. He's like, right? But because it's so squished in, he was like, you can't say that, what's like, you know, I'm gonna have to talk about how much I'm right? Okay. So he's talking, and I'm like, whatever, let him talk, he's having a bad day, it's cool, you know, I'm enjoying it, man. Now, I can't move, he can't move, he's talking, talking, talking. But at around 30, 35 seconds, he runs out of vocabulary. Right? He doesn't know what else to say. He's told me to go back to India. He's told me why you have big box, why you have so much facial hair, go home and shave. He said everything, right? He's run out, he's like, I don't know, he's like, I just. <laughs> you know, stuff like that. So I'm standing there like, you know what, this is, this is, I feel bad for him, right? You know, we still have 20 more seconds, he's looking at me, and we like to say, you know, hey, I don't want to do that, right? And I'm like, you know what, maybe I can just save the day, you know, whatever, let me kill some time. So that's when I was like, Apa. And that's when he's like, oh, huh? Like he's like, why did you tell me earlier? I'm like, I'm sorry, is it my fault for not interrupting your discrimination focused dialogue? I don't understand, right? But the best part of that was not even the fact that he was awkward and I was having a fun time with him. It was the people around me. The moment I said that, everyone else clearly knew what he was saying but did not say anything, suddenly went silent. The whole car was silent. All you could hear are people standing there holding the handle going <laughs> Right? And the, the best part for me was like, he's a lucky man because if, let's say, the train doors open on the other side I would not move I would be like, I bought you and me, she'd run all the way <laughs> oh, Nowhere, man, you know? <laughs> now again, flip it around, that was clearly a racial discrimination It's very wrong, I could kind of report him, tell people complain, take a photo of him, put it online, you'll complain the link or I could say, you know what, whatever, dude, you know, let's have a good time, let's just laugh about it. If anything, my telling this story or my doing this to this gentleman over here would immediately make him change, shift his mindset of the next time he sees someone who's not Chinese, he will think twice and go like, wait a second, I better not say anything yet, let me test it out. He's like, okay, let's go, right? Hey guys, thank you much, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you for today.